Good afternoon. I'm Emily Ackerman, the Director of Business Development here at Lane Gorman Trubit. I want to welcome you to our third webinar of 2022. Today's webinar is the third installment of our eight part series, Aiming Towards Success. Today, we'll be discussing the NFTs as art and investment with Alex Moore and Andrea Perez from Carrington Coleman. We're excited to be offering a diverse selection of webinars in 2022. And to tell those of you joining for the first time today, Lane Gorman Trivet is a mid-size accounting firm for all business sizes. And in 2022, LGT will be providing you endless opportunities for gaining CPE credit. These events are created to help your business grow and thrive. With that being said, let me introduce our presenters today. Alex Moore is a partner at Carrington Coleman. He oversees the firm's litigation department and his practice focuses on securities and DNO matters, trial advocacy, speech and privacy protection, and blockchain technology. Andrea Perez is a partner at Carrington Coleman. She assists her clients um, through a broad spectrum of issues, including art law, corporate law, and intellectual property. Outside the firm, Andrea is a lecturer at Southern Methodist University, teaching international law and the arts as part of an international master's degree program. All right, now let's get into the real skinny of this, Alex and Andrea. What is digital and generative art? So I wanted to start our talk today about digital and general generative art first, because I feel like in order to understand NFT, to first understand a grasp that there's this entire medium of art out there that is very well respected in digital and generative art. So, um, hang on here, let me get to the next slide. And, um, and once you kind of understand that, then it's sort of easier to understand what an NFT is and how it's created. Um, so for example, here on this slide, I've got two images. Um, the one here on the left is the media wall in at and Discovery District. If you're in Dallas, you're familiar with this. Um, you'll see a huge panel um, against the building. Um, this is actually an LED screen that's 8,730 square feet wide. Wow. And massive, right? Um, 18.2 million pixels. And at any one point in time, when you're in this area, you will see digital artwork displayed or generative art too, um, displayed on this. And so this is this is a piece, these are works of art that ATP has purchased and has purchased the rights to display on this huge screen, right? right? Um, and so digital art is something that's created with digital technology. This could be a photograph. Um, it could be, you know, some kind of audiovisual work like what's shown at at and It could be, you know, CGI. I mean, video games. Yeah. Video game is just all digital art, right? 3D printers, things that created with 3D printers, right? So there is a huge market for this. Um, and it is, again, very well respected in the art community. Um, there's also generative art, which is used creating essentially computers um, in that there's a, an autonomous ability for the computer itself to create the work. Um, there's a sort of code or algorithms that are, are plugged in and then the computer itself can create something. So the example on the right here is this work by Mario Klingman, which is beautiful and it has two screens. These are two LED TV screens. And inside that little furniture piece is the brain. And it's a computer brain that sifts through thousands of sort of old master work portraits and uh, creates um, brand new portraits. And you can see sort of this kind of ghost-like portraits there. It's on a constant looping feed and no tour alike, and it's continuous over and over and over and over. And this is sort of generative art where the computer itself is now has some artificial intelligence in creating things. Um, and these aren't new things like generative art has been around since the 60s. There's an artist named Harold Cohen, who actually is sort of deemed with being the first generative artist in that he created a computer program for robots to then paint something. So um, it's been around for quite a while and, um, and it's something that you can purchase. There's galleries that specialize in this type of artwork. There's um, entire art fairs that are incredibly successful that specialize in these types of artwork. So understanding that there's, there's art 
that is digital generative, then now let's sort of transition over to how this translates to an NFT. So NFT uh, stands for non-fungible assets. Um, and so fungible is something that is easily exchangeable one-to-one, -one, dollar for dollar, Bitcoin for Bitcoin, um, Ether for Ether. Um, these are things that it doesn't matter, you know, when my dollar was minted, it still has, it's still the dollar, right? Um, or printed, I should say. Um, but then when you have uh, non-fungible, these are not one-to-one -one exchanges. So there is only one Mona Lisa, right? Um, and so that is the concept behind NFTs is uh, a digital file, and it can be artwork, it can be music, it can be video, it can even be documents, things like that, that there's one of a kind that then becomes connected to a blockchain. If it is not added to a blockchain, it is not an NFT. To have an NFT, it has to be connected to the blockchain. Otherwise, you just have some kind of digital, digital file. So, um, so understanding that, then it sort of makes sense of, oh, well, there's all these NFTs, different kinds of forms of art that I can buy now um, that are connected to the blockchain. And so the blockchain is um, similar to a ledger uh, and it allows you to sort of, you know, you know, um, catalog what you've created and it's open uh, in that um, others can see what's been created. And then you can also trace openly who's purchasing it as well too. So, um, so these are kind of, this is how we are, this is, these are NFTs, right? Um, but there's so much information out there and there's a lot of noise that it can kind of be a bit confusing. So in NFTs, although they're like all the rage right now and you know you can't open you know any newspaper article or see anything on Google, Twitter feed, whatever about talking about NFTs, it's not necessarily new. Um, you know, they've been around since the early 90s. Um, there were sort of two scientists named um, Stuart Haber and Scott Sornetta, who um, were interested in creating some kind of technology that had a time-saving ability and an ability to provide, so you could verify your, um, you know, information that had become digital, you know, digital files. And they were ironically very concerned at the time about how are we gonna live in this digital age and be able to tell what's real and what's not real? you know, um, fake news, right? Do things like that. How do we, this was sort of their concern then was how do we, how do we create a system so that we know if it's digital, it hasn't been manipulated or isn't in the original um, format of how I wanted it. And they actually created sort of kind of the first blockchain back then. And uh, it was called Surety Blockchain and scientists could, well, mostly even scientists could have an ability to sort of record their research and papers and then um, in, in a manner that could be verified and sort of have a security on it. And it was really, they actually, um, every Sunday in the New York Times, if you had recorded sort of your um, research and information with this surety blockchain, you could go and get a link in, in the notices of the New York Times to click on that and check to make sure your information was actually still there and not altered. So these are kind of like the, this is the very first concept of, you know, uh, the idea behind the blockchain is providing security, right? So, and it sort of expanded, you know, from there, um, you know, Bitcoin in 2009, and then Ethereum launches in 2014. And then sort of the first NFT started to be created or minted as, it, as it's called in the, the NFT lingo. And so um, I've, I've put up two, some of there's, you know, there's a debate of what's the first NFT still, right? And so who took a digital asset, a digital file, whether it was, you know, an image, um, you know, document, audio, visual clip, music, and, and added it to the blockchain, right? Connected it to the blockchain. And um, so it's sort of argued that one of the first ones was this one on the left here, Kevin McCoy. Um, it's called Quantum. It was actually sold last year at Sotheby's for 1.47 million. And I'll play a little clip of it. Um, 
and you can see that this is what wow that, yeah right <laughs> so so cool um i'll play it again because i was pretty short <laughs> but yeah um so this is something that was created and uploaded to to a blockchain now um kevin unfortunately is currently involved in a lawsuit already over this um because there's different blockchains right and uh he he first minted this on a block on a very very old blockchain called namecoin which had some weird rules about if you didn't sort of renew uh and continue to claim ownership of your nfts that you had minted and put on the blockchain you would lose rights to them and but kevin also minted the nft on ethereum blockchain and so when this was sold, Sotheby's sold the version of it on, on Ethereum blockchain. And um, now there's sort of this group, this holding company called Free Holdings. It's a, a Canadian company. They noticed that the NFT on Namecoin blockchain was, um, it was unclaimed. So they claim it up at the last second here, snag it up and say, no, 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 no. You know, we own that nft what you did was you know essentially kevin you don't own any rights to it we now own it and they obviously it's the money grab and they want that 1.47 million so this is a really interesting case to watch because it's a battle of competing blockchains and ownership on you know how ownership on one ownership other can affect one another um so it's kind of something to watch uh I, you know i have my other thoughts being an art lawyer you know i think kevin owns the underlying copyrights to it so i don't know how that's going to play out but um and then the next uh image i've got here is crypto punks which is incredibly popular um you know it it is um this was a series of these little images little profiles um, there was 10,000 of them. Um, that was all that was created. And everyone's different. There's, they're all unique. And so they were created with like an algorithm with a computer that sort of mismatched different features and things like that. And they were actually created by a group of Canadians and they were originally released for free. Um, they liked the idea of collecting hockey cards and they thought that these were something like a collectible. They were trying to create sort of a digital collectible that you would, you know, some rarity and something that you could have. Um, but they've already taken off crazy and upon resale, extremely valuable because these are also considered some of the first NFTs. And, you know, so for example, you know, some of them have sold, um, you know, one sold for 23.7 million. It's estimated they've sold probably in total about 2.7 2.6 billion regarding these crypto punks. Um, and if you have a crypto punk and you're uh, interested in NFTs, it's sort of like having a blue chip piece of art and having one of the original ones. Um, and so uh, there's different ways to mint these NFTs. And uh, like Ethereum is a blockchain that offers that. Um, there's other websites that, Ethereum is probably the most popular, but there's other websites sort of that help you do that too. And they help mm -hmm. specifically with artists create these too. Um, Maris Art is uh, a company since 2015 has been helping artists um, put their artwork on a blockchain through, through an NFT. Um, and so there's there's lots of different ways of doing that, and there's different blockchain options as well. Um, but if you're you know interested in sort of creating your own NFT, there's um, there's the help out there. So um, NFTs, you know, based on what we're seeing in the art market, and you know, just in discussions with my clients and and. Um, connections in the art world, they are not going away. Um, this is something that, um, you know, the art market is very interested in. You can buy NFTs at Sotheby's, Christie's, Heritage, wow. Philip, all of them. They're all accepting cryptocurrency to purchase these things. Amazing. Um, and uh, they're making a, a significant amount of money off of it. Um, and so it, it's, you know, I, we're, Alex and I are going to further talk about this, but um, there's going to be, uh, I think, um, a lot of different changes in the NFT market, but it, it, it's not going away. So. Amazing.
And so, um, Alex, I'll let you talk about this. Um, he's much more knowledgeable about me about sort of the, you know, the, the smart contract involved with the NFT sales. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a bit about kind of why. You know, the, the, Andrea mentioned that uh, you've had digital art, you've had generative art outside of the NFT space. So why? what's the point of linking it to a blockchain, uh, something like Ethereum? And the answer has to do with something else Andrea mentioned, which is that blockchains ultimately are a, a ledger that allows you to see and prove what you can call the provenance. You know, where did this particular token, this non-fungible token begin? And where is it now? And how is that token distinct from say a copy, no different than say, you could say the Mona Lisa was another example that Andrea put up. You can buy a print of the Mona Lisa. You could even commission a reproduction that looks exactly like the original, but it will never be the original. And the, the way to, to show that you own the original to the exclusion of any copy provenance is something that there's an entire industry behind in the art world. And so, uh, what blockchain technology allows you to do is to build that verification into the digital asset, the digital art itself. Uh, and you got to understand where developers are coming from when they, they came up with this idea. Uh, for people in the audience who maybe have an engineering background, you can appreciate that this came from a place of I don't really trust lawyers and human beings interpreting contracts subjectively. I trust code and I trust computers. I want to know that if I, I want to be able to trust this system and not have to worry about humans mucking it up. And so what I have up here on the screen is an example uh, of a way you can render a, a contractual provision into code. If you wanted to say, escrow uh, earnest money to purchase, in this case, uh, metaverse real estate. That's a real thing, by the way. You can go look up the other side offering on OpenSea. Uh, but you want to give the seller the ability to cancel during the due diligence period and give the earnest money back. Rather than rely on a written contract that might have to get litigated, you could put that in code and have it be self-executing. And that is very attractive for a lot of developers and yeah. creates a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of perils. Uh, and so the, the general idea behind blockchain technology as it pertains to all of this is that rather than rely on third parties, financial institutions, clearing houses, yeah. uh, trusted uh, intermediaries, we are going to have a decentralized network that is going to maintain this ledger and this proof for everyone's benefit. And when you talk about uh, fees in cryptocurrency, you sometimes hear people talk about gas. Uh, those are fees that are getting paid to the computers that host this ledger and maintain the integrity of the network. And that's the, the kind of easy way to understand, well, easiest way to understand that piece of the technology. For sure. Now, this sounds like a silly question to even ask, but how do you even purchase NFTs? So there are a few different ways. Well, there's a lot of different ways you can purchase NFTs. So um, NFTs, as Andrew mentioned, can reside on any number of different blockchains. Probably the most popular one right now is Ethereum. And it's just like any other deal where if you find someone who's a seller of an NFT, you can approach them and on whatever blockchain their token is on, purchase it from them. Uh, this could be as easy as searching for NFTs on Twitter and contacting content creators directly. Uh, but there's also a number of marketplaces and I'll, I'll uh, pass the mic back to Andrea to talk a bit about those marketplaces. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of websites that have dedicated themselves to being, you know, I don't want to call it, but like the eBay of NFTs, right, where you can find all of these. Um, but uh, you know, there's there's a lot of um, differences 
um, in these sites as well too. So um, like for example, art blocks is really focused on artists themselves that are creating generative art. And um, whereas, you know, something like OpenSea is kind of more of a free for all. Um, it could be these sort of profile tokens like we saw with CryptoPond. It could be um, just all kinds of things. Um, and uh, it could be, you know, um, art that's in the public domain that someone's trying to sell too. Um, that's happening um, quite a bit as well. And like for one example, here I've got Law Collection. Well, this is a place where you could buy NFTs in co connection, in collaboration, sorry, with like the British Museum and Leopold Museum in Vienna. And what they've done is taken works of art that are in the public domain essentially and created NFTs off of that. And then you could buy those nfts so um there's a there's i mean and this is just a small sample there's so many other um nfts out there and um in different sites to purchase on and so i think it'd be really cool if alex wants to talk about his nft in his background right now that he purchased <laughs> i will and it's, it'll actually be a great segue to a couple questions that have come up so uh for this presentation i gave myself an assignment i said I want to buy an NFT that I can use as the background for this presentation. And I want to have some bare minimum of confidence that whatever I bought, I'm actually buying some meaningful intellectual property rights in the asset that I'm purchasing. And it was a very difficult thing to do. Uh, a lot of content creators, you know, list their NFTs for sale on marketplaces like the ones uh, listed in this slide but they don't really give any thought to whether they're conveying intellectual property rights along with it. Uh, and as a result, there's a very open question of when you buy an NFT, what exactly are you buying? Are you buying a hyperlink? Are you buying a copy of the image? Are you buying rights in the original image? Uh, this was about the best I could do on relatively short notice. And this particular content creator uh, represents uh, really only that, uh, uh, what is it? The the holder of the NFT has quote all IP rights. So uh, uh, you know, fun litigating that in the future. <laughs> um, this is somewhat germane to two questions asked in the the chat. One is, um, you know, isn't it true that most NFTs for sale are fraudulent or counterfeit, uh, and that most traffic is fraudulent? And you know, certainly it is true that there are counterfeit NFTs uh, on all these sites. It is, it, it, anybody could go take a screenshot of an image, post it, claim it as their own. And yeah, there are, there are ways to um, report that, but it is a, a, a legitimate problem. Uh, there was another question about, is this, you know, given that forgery and theft in the real art world are concerns, are those concerns with NFTs? The answer is absolutely. Um, and you know, there's a related question about sales and very briefly what I'd say, this question deals with the idea that like, let's say I'm publishing a bunch of NFTs and I want to pump up the price of my NFTs. Can't I just open up another account, buy my own NFT at a really high price to make it look like it's worth something? Um, this stuff does happen. Uh, but the, the question there was, is it most? And there's a citation to the Wall Street Journal and Wired. And, and what I'd say is, I haven't had the opportunity to review that data, but I'd be, I'd be pretty surprised because how do you even determine that? What is the sample size? What is the verification to, to back up the idea that quote unquote, most of the NFTs are, are counterfeit? I, I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I would be, I'd be surprised if that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some, some thoughts about that and, uh, and an explanation for the, uh, the abstract art I have behind me. Yeah, and and I mean it's I mean this is in the regular art world too, right? Um, you know, there's I mean, but you know, um, I mean it's out there, but how do we know how much? You know, there's I mean you've got to be careful, right? Like just with when you're buying physical art, um, you know, when you're buying a digital digital asset, a digital piece, right? Um, you have to do your due diligence. Um, you know, there's, I would be very nervous about buying a Jackson Pollock off of eBay, <laughs> like, you know, that doesn't, but there are, 
sites that are selling NFTs that are similar to their digital galleries, right? They've got, um, you know, they have gallerists behind them. They have the artists verifying and signing off on that. So uh, it's about where you're, you know, just making smart decisions and, uh, you know, before you, before you purchase. Um, um, because, you know, yeah, there is, I mean, there's a lot of content out there right now, so. So um, I'm definitely gonna let Alex, this is his, his value, I definitely talk oh. about security because this is sort of, you know, when when you're buying these and, some, and, and sometimes people are, you know, crowdfunding and getting all this money together to purchase an NFT, things like that. So, you know, how, how are NFTs sitting in the world of securities and securities regulations? So. Thanks for that. And, and uh, let's leave it on this slide before we go to the next slide for a minute. Let me give some context. So as Emily mentioned at the beginning of the hour, I'm, I, I have a background as a securities lawyer and, um, you know, before NFTs were all the rave, there's this uh, big boom in what were called ICOs or initial coin offerings, which were thousands of new cryptocurrencies that were getting issued into, uh, into the world. And a lot of them uh, were what are called securities. They're investment vehicles. Uh, and it creates a big problem because then there's a lot of fraud out there in the market uh, that needs to be uh, needs to be dealt with. You have innocent investors who are falling victim to Ponzi schemes and what are called in the community rug pulls. Um, and it's it's a it's 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 definitely a problem. Um, so what what happened was. Uh, the SEC looked at this and in a particular case study in 2017, looked at a, a, a so-called DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And this is something that gets bandied around a lot. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the context of the Board Ape Yacht Club. But um, if we can go to the next slide, what, what happened was uh, a group of people got together and issued these so-called DAO tokens and said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let the DAO token holders basically vote their tokens as shares to decide what they wanna spend the money that we raised on. So we're gonna sell all these tokens, we're gonna to raise all this money, and then we're gonna let the, the token holders vote on what we spend it on as a kind of uh, a group decision. And the SEC investigated and said, hey, this looks like a security to us and the, the the organization's head said, no, we're, we don't meet the definition of a security because it's decentralized. It is our users who are deciding what to do, not us. The SEC disagreed and said, well, the problem with that is, is you don't really have a forum that allows your users, your token holders to communicate with each other meaningfully to form voting blocks. And oh, by the way, you are the ones who are controlling what the proposals are that they get to vote on. And so the token holders didn't have meaningful control. Uh, and so the SEC issued what they call the, the, the DAO release, the DAO report. And in it, they chart out this very basic outline to determine whether or not uh, a virtual token might be a security. And one is, is it an investment in a common enterprise, which can be an exchange of value for, of any kind of value, not just money. So it could be Ether or Bitcoin. Two, the expectation of profits. Uh, you know, are you buying this asset with the expectation that it's going to appreciate in value and you're going to resell it? And is that expectation of profit based on the efforts of others? And this is really the, the most critical element. If you buy uh, what you might call blue chip art, you know, uh, uh, or, or an NFT for that matter, and your only expectation of profit is that over time it'll appreciate in value and I can resell it in the same way that you buy real estate and hope it appreciates in value. Well, that's not necessarily a security. That The key added element is that someone else is going to do some work that is going to make it valuable. Uh, and, and that is the critical difference. For example, uh, when I bought the NFT that's now my background, I have no expectation that the creator that I paid for this is going to take my Ethereum 
and do anything to enhance its value. Its value is intrinsic. It is what it is. It, I have no expectation of future efforts. But that's not true in every NFT project. And some of the NFT projects we'll be looking at in a moment, uh, such as the Board at Yacht Club and others that are very popular right now, do have this element of this promise that, hey, we're going to sell all these NFTs, and then we're going to take the proceeds of those NFTs, and we're going we're gonna to then do something to enhance their value and, and, and give that back to the NFT holders. And, and that's when you start to beg the question of whether or not this may actually be security. Um, and so with that, let's take a look at uh, probably one of the biggest headline examples of NFT projects, the Board AB, AB Yacht Club. This These names was, are great. Yeah, the, this was a NFT project that is a little over a year old by a group who call themselves Yuga Labs. Incidentally, you saw in Andrea's earlier slide, CryptoPunks were one of the earliest NFT projects. Yuga Labs uh, uh, subsequently bought uh, uh, that that project and then delegated the IP rights back to the the holders of those uh, of those NFTs. It's a whole different story, but um, basically, this like CryptoPunks uh, was a quote unquote PFP project, and that's an acronym that stands for Profile Picture. The idea is that when you buy a board ape you then can put that as your profile picture and it's, it's, it's like a club. It is a club membership pass. And you can even see uh, the description uh, of the, 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 the collection says that your board ape doubles as a membership card and grants you access to members only benefits such as their online graffiti board with quote unquote future perks that can be unlocked. And Already, this starts to sound uh, a little bit more like something that could be an investment. I have an expectation of appreciation and value from something someone else is going to do. Um, that's not the end of the story. There, is, there are other aspects of this where there's community collaboration, participation, and things like that. Uh, but it is, uh, it's a significant issue that, uh, that needs to be considered. And if we go to the next slide, Oh, this is just to give you an idea of the volume of all of this. So oh my gosh. Um, the, the, the most recent sale of a board ape uh, was for 117 ETH worth approximately 274,000. But if you look down to the bottom one, that one sold for $586,000. And so this is no joke. There's a lot of real money uh, being invested in the space. Wow. Um, and so that is... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there with this example, uh, but we will come back to some of these issues as we continue the conversation. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's crazy because these board apes is like what you're getting is, as you'd see here, like these little images, these little unique similar crypto punks, like these little personalities that you can now, you know, use as your profile picture or say you own and, um, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, essentially, I mean, it is art, you know, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, I, and I guess, yeah. Oh. I apologize. I had one more slide on this. If you, if you go to the Board Ape Yacht Club's website, this is what they tell you it is. It's 10,000 quote, provably rare tokens. This is the, the non-fungible component. They're each unique and there's only one. When they were originally sold, they were for 0.08 ETH, which is, you know, uh, kind of roughly 275 bucks. So you could think about if you had bought one of these in April of 2021 for $275, uh, how much that would be worth today, 275,000, uh, not, not a bad return on investment. Uh, they claim that ownership and commercial usage rights are given to the consumer for their NFT, uh, but, I can tell you right now, you can pour through their terms of service and there's not a lot that's more specific of a disclosure than that. Hmm. One of the questions that came up in the chat was, will there ever be copyright protection for NFTs? And as Andrea can discuss better than I can, you know, property is a, like the lawyers like to say, is a bundle of sticks and it rights don't all necessarily pass with the art. And so, you know, I, I do think that, and this is germane to, again, this NFT that I have behind me, you have this very booming uh, marketplace for NFTs, 
but a very underdeveloped sense of intellectual property rights that go along with it. And I think what you'll see in the long run as this marketplace matures is more consideration and more thought being paid to making sure that what the content creators intend to pass as ownership rights when they sell their NFTs is actually what comes to pass. Um, we saw reference to this graffiti board here. And then this last piece here, additional benefits through roadmap activations. This is something I'm seeing on a lot of new NFT projects that are these kind of club membership deals where when you buy in, you're not necessarily getting everything right then and there. They're promising you that there's a roadmap for future development of new things you're going to get. So with that, I'll turn it back to Andrea for our next example. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that's sort of like, we're seeing this division in sort of the type of NFTs, right? You've got this board yeah. club um, situation, these club-like things where you sort of get these, these profile tokens that, you know, are unique and then gives you access to other things or there's value in that. But then there's also sort of, you know, the, the realm of just, you know, artists themselves, like legitimate professional artists creating NFTs. Um, not to say that the art artist behind creating the the images of the different apes wasn't, you know, an artist, but um, you know, there, there's sort of there's we're seeing different camps, different types of of NFTs too. And and Alex brought up a really good point of IP ownership. And I guess we had also had a question about copyrights and you know, co how copyrights typically work is the, the creator of the artwork themselves retains the copyright. And so if I paint a painting or create a digital work of art, um, that's mine. Now I can sell you um, the ability to have that physical work in your house or the ability for you to have a, a, a copy of that digital file for you to display it um, and for you to exhibit it or for you to, um, you know, sell the work, but I'm not, you don't typically get commercial rights with it. So that means the ability to put it on a t-shirt and sell those t-shirts, the ability to, um, you know, make additional copies of it and, and commercialize it that way. And so, you know, what, what Alex and both of us seen is, you know, with all of these sites that you can purchase NFTs, there's not really a consensus on what rights as the buyer you're getting. Um, you know, I, I think in, from, you know, my experience in the art world, I think it should be something as similar to buying a, you know, a physical work of art, like you have the right to physically possess it, you have the right to display it and exhibit it. But, um, you know, if I want to go and start, you know, selling t-shirts off of it, um, I'm not allowed to do that. That's going to stay with the original artist. Um, that's not to say that an artist can give up their copyrights and, you know, physical possession of something is separate from giving copyrights, but, um, you know, there's just a, so it's one other thing of, you know, sort of buyer beware right now too, is reading the terms of service on what you're actually receiving. So, um, one thing we wanted to kind of sort of um, end with here is um, some interesting projects with NFTs. So we've kind of talked about the two, um, you know, main topics that we see, which are main kinds of NFTs, which is, you know, um, you know, fine artists creating them, um, but then also um, these sort of collectibles, things like that. Um, but there's some other really cool things that can be done with NFTs and the technology is going to continue to evolve. So um, what Alex and I are talking about today could be six months from now, very different. I mean, this is a wild, wild west right now. So um, a couple examples here, um, sort of in the top left is um, Ukraine. Ukraine created a limited edition NFTs to help them raise money for their army. And so what they had, they created, I think it was 50, let me get the number correct here for you, 54 NFTs that were worked with, with, with fine artists, visual artists, they created works of art that documented certain events that happened in the first three days of war with Russia. And then they created a museum of war. This was all done through their, for their, through their government. And you could purchase these NFTs um, for relatively low price. They sold them for about $500 each but wow. oh go ahead emily i like to said wow that that that's amazing yeah. just in yeah. terms of the initiative 
But something that you can do with smart contracts is build in a resale royalty, a royalty. So when these are now these very rare NFTs, when they are now sold second, third time, the government of Ukraine is getting a portion of those sales. Interesting. Yeah, right? Like, so this is something that's really, really attractive to artists, photographers, digital artists, things like that, of ours, because the U.S. doesn't have a a law that requires artists um, to receive a portion of profits when their artwork is sold a second or third time. I mean, there are countries, many, many countries that have this, um, you know, mostly in the European Union and the UK that, you know, the art, the artist itself can continue to profit. So in this case, it's giving the ability to Ukraine to continue to receive some money to help their military, right? So that's an mm-hmm. NFT for like a, a you know, a, a good reason, right? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and then we got, uh, uh, you know, another project here where it was actually just recently this year, um, there was an NFT sold of a yacht. Now, you got to understand you're not, the, the physical yacht obviously can't be on the blockchain, but if only. you were buying the NFT that essentially was used to buy the boat. And then, and so the boat, and that's an image of the boat, like they showed pictures, you know, what the, you know, the boat you were getting, and then it has to be manufactured. But then something you also get at, um, once the boat's manufactured, you get a second NFT that create, that contains the metadata and the blueprints and the plans and sort of how, how the boat was manufactured, right? So that's, you know, another cool little project um you know that you could see sort of more things like that like i'm gonna buy an nft that has a value to it but then also provides me something tangible as well so um something also interesting that i came across was um this model um i've got this is a picture in the top um right here uh Emily Radajakowski, she um, she was victim. Um, she was a victim, I'm going to say, of Richard Prince. Richard Prince is an appropriations artist. Uh, he's very famous. His work sells for six, seven figures. But he is known for taking someone's someone else's artwork, tweaking a little bit, and then selling it for a lot more. And one of his most controversial projects was he went to Instagram and photos he liked or caught his attention, he would put in the comments, he'd write something in the comments, because you you know, on Instagram photos, you can write a comment, and then screenshot it, so show his comment, and then blow up the picture to these massive size and sold a series of them. They started at around $90,000 each. So it was someone else's photo, all he did was add the comment, and he sells it. Obviously, the people who were in these photos were extremely upset because a lot of these photos were taken by professional photographers and things like that. And Emily was one of them. She was a model. And he took that photo and sold that of her. And she was obviously very upset. So her way of getting her rights back and felt like what she she didn't get any money off of his sale of those those prints um, was she decided through Christie's, I'm going to create my um my own nft and in that that's this is what she created which is her in front of that work uh and sell that uh as a way to get you know what she felt was was due to her um for being the subject in of richard richard prince's artwork so and she sold it for for about one hundred seventy five thousand. so she got her she got her money back after that but um Yeah, there's pretty, I mean, there's lots of things out there, Um, you know, and I'll I'll let, um, you know, Alex kind of, you know, if he's got any other additional cool things that that he's seen um, about NFTs, so let him Yeah, and I wanted to pick up on something you mentioned earlier, Andrea, regarding using smart contracts to do cool things like give commissions back to the original artist. There was a a question that came up about, like, it's kind of like, what else can you do with the smart contracts could you for example have smart contracts that in some way restricted uh future use uh that would that would make it so that um uh the 
the and that the that the buyer may not be able to use the NFT for everything. And the answer is that you can use smart contracts to do all manner of really clever things within the ecosystem of that blockchain. So to be specific, Andrea mentioned royalties. It's a really easy example. If I, this is a perfect example. So the NFT that's behind me has built into it um, a, um, a feature where any, where if I sell it, any subsequent sale, 10% of that sale in Ethereum goes back to the content creator. And that's gonna be true for the life of this thing on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, on the other hand, and, and by the way, you could also have something like uh, a right of first refusal is something that may be familiar to people in the audience where it's like, um, maybe the content creator doesn't want me to just sell this to anybody. And if I try and sell it, I have to give them the opportunity to buy it back first. That's something you could code in. But things like restrictions on use and dissemination, like commercial use or, non, uh, or, or non-commercial use, that's automatically going to be used on some other platform, for example, on Facebook, on Twitter. And those systems are not linked to the blockchain. And so they don't follow, they're not bound by those smart contract rules. By contrast, you could look at an example like Top Shots, the, which is the NBA's um, NFT platform for uh, digital uh, trading cards, which is another really easy use case and example. Um, the, uh, uh, the, what they do is all of your, uh, rights are linked to the user's use and, and of those, what they call moments, like a dunk, uh, on their platform only. So what they say is, look, you don't have any rights, certainly no commercial rights to take the Top Shot's digital trading cards, their moments, and, and do anything outside of our platform. But within our platform, here are all the rights that you do have, and they're very well defined. Uh, and this goes to uh, th this question of, of copyright and, and best practices. And I think what you're seeing is the most sophisticated parties right now are not necessarily trying to code these intellectual property rights into the token or the blockchain, Rather, what they're using are rather are more conventional terms of sale and licensing to define those when they when they actually go out. Uh, we got another question about if an Ethereum contract is transferred to another blockchain, then those self-executing features would stop working. But this is, I mean, it's 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 mixing together several concepts. You know, it, if a contract that's on the Ethereum blockchain moves to a different blockchain. You know, it's no longer an Ethereum contract. It, it, it depends, you know, because different blockchains may be uh, uh, offshoots of Ethereum, and so they may operate the same way. They may not. Um, this token, the, the NFT that's behind me, currently only exists, you know, on the Ethereum blockchain. Could someone take a screenshot of it and put it on a different blockchain like Solana and come up with different rules that govern it? Sure. But that's a copy. It'd be no different than if I uh, did a, a perfect copy reproduction of the Mona Lisa and then tried to get it hung up in some other art gallery. Like, of course you can do that, but it's still not the original thing. And I'm the only one who can prove the provenance of what I own that goes back to the original content creator and then has those same use restrictions that go along with it. Um, other interesting projects that are coming out, these kind of profile picture projects are, uh, are, are becoming very popular. There's another one right now that's very popular called Moonbirds. And it's one where you can see a lot of activity around and a really big community that's growing. What these communities are doing that's a little bit different than um, the problem community that the SEC talked about in the Dow report is they often are linked with Discord servers. And so anyone who owns the NFT, part of that club pass also gets you into this virtual chat room, which then becomes a way that members can actually get together, vote on initiatives and meaningfully participate in the project, whatever that project is. There's also a uh, virtual real estate. We, I talked briefly earlier about the offering of other side. Um, I think this is a, a very speculative area, but you're seeing a lot of activity there. This, 
whole idea that Mark Zuckerberg brought up about the metaverse being the future. Well, the, the question is in the, in the metaverse of digital land, you know, who are going to be your digital land holders? And uh, there's, you kind of see there's, there's this sense of wanting to rush to, to, to plant your flag on some piece of digital land. The problem is, of course, who knows what that landscape is actually going to end up being and, and whether or not it's going to be worth anything. It's all very speculative. Um, a more kind of kind of close to home example would be um, in-game assets. You see this a lot in, in video games where uh, the video game may be free to play, but if you want certain aesthetics, you want uh, a particular look for your character, or you want uh, some kind of in-game asset, you have to pay for it. And those really are NFTs. They are unique. Uh, uh, you know, there may be a thousand of them, but they're, they're you know, they're a limited number. Again, digital trading cards is a really good analogy here. There's a limited print of that card. And you're seeing a lot of people work on how can we uh, then move those in-game assets across different platforms so I can showcase them in other places and, and things like that. So uh, I think, you know, my, my big take here is NFTs in some form, I think, are here to stay and are inevitable. I think that in the same way that real world physical assets have this attribute of collectability. If, if anybody in the audience who collects anything or, or, or have ever collected, you collected coins, you collected cards, you collect watches, um, they may not be entirely unique, but they are unique within their, their run. You know, you're buying one of only however many that are ever actually in existence. And it's this exact concept just applied to digital assets. And, People somehow seem that there's this kind of running meme or joke that, well, I can just screenshot your NFT, but it's just not the same thing. And like, I, I can I can find your authentic Babe Ruth vintage baseball card and I can scan it and print it on a color printer, but I still don't have the thing itself. And so that is one of the aspects I think people fail to grasp about NFTs. The other aspect is this, uh, call it extrinsic value, where it's not just about the image, it's about the, the other things that come with that image, whether that's club membership or, or other things along like that. Yeah, and I'm so glad you touched on that because whenever someone asks me, um, like, well, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I can just screenshot. And I'm like, yes, I can go to a museum and, and take pictures of all the paintings, but they're not mine. And I can't like make a print of it and sell that print. You know, they're, they're not, I don't own that. Great. I have a picture for personal use. Um, and, and it's just, there, there is with digital assets, it is an asset. There is an original uh, and there is, there is value with that. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of anytime I get a question about NFT, that's like, it's all that example is always used. And I'm like, well, no, but you have to understand it, it's still not the original. You're, you're still violating someone's copyright. So, um, you know, and, you know, to touch also on the fact that these are here to stay. Um, so Art Basel puts up an annual report every year of, you know, what's going on in the art market. Who's buying what, what's more popular, what's the, you know, how many sales. And so in 2021, um, there was 8.6 billion in NFT sales. So there was roughly about 50 billion in all, all art sales total, including antiquities. So you can see that that's a significant chunk and it's increasing crazy. It, it continues, 2022 is gonna be even higher than that. Um, they recorded about 5.5 million just NFT sales transactions. Now, uh, and that was that was what was reported to you know Art Basel. So um, it, it's not something that you know I think we should be ignoring and say that um, you know it's just the bottom's going to fall out. I think there's going to be some of the you know less valuable NFTs sort of you know, that, that's going to go away, but there, there is going to be the ones that contain value um, and, uh, you know, are unique will continue to, to, in, to increase in value as well too. And, um, and we're, you know, I mean, uh, like I said, all the major auction companies are, are devoting significant uh, their amount of time to developing their NFT clientele. Um, and the clientele for NFTs is young. So most of them are usually under 40. 
Um, and these are, you know, obviously, you know, they're starting to collect young, but they're going to continue to collect as, you know, as they get older too. Um, you know, for me personally, like growing up in the eighties, I never thought about holding on to my video game consoles and my video game cartridges and things like that. Now they're extremely valuable. And I'm really upset. I don't have my original Nintendo anymore. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Right. Um, but you know, uh, and again, to Alex's point, everyone collects something. So maybe, you know, NFTs is not something you're interested in collecting in, but there are others that are, and, um, you know, um, kind of to, to each, to each its own. So, uh, with that, I think we're near the, the end here, but do we, I want to make sure, do we answer everyone's question? There were a few questions that came in at the end. One was about taxation. The short answer is mm -hmm. NFTs are taxed as personal property, just like any other personal property. So physical assets. Um, and the other one was about insurance. And the short answer is insurers are catching up to this, although it's very new. We do have relationships with some brokers who do, uh, who help place uh, and, and get insurance for uh, crypto assets and NFT assets. There's also crypto insurance that is out there, like decentralized insurance that is itself kind of a smart contract. I cannot in good faith recommend that at this point based on the diligence I've done so far, but that is a thing that exists in the universe. Um, we just got one more question yeah. uh, about energy. So the proof of work system, um, is, let's see if I can give a very long answer in a very short period of time. There is a general uh, consensus of that we should and um and are migrating from proof of work to proof of stake. What what that means is that the integrity of the network will be um, uh, ensured because of the number of computers who are uh, kind of backing it. And so the environmental that that should help alleviate the environmental impact. I could say, I could give an entire different hour long talk about this issue of ESG in crypto. If you want to know more, uh, you're welcome to back channel me and Andrea. It's a very lengthy discussion, but uh, I would say that the trend is away from proof of work as of now. Well, guys, thank you so much for hopping on. Alex, Andrea, y'all are fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank NFTs you. Thank for life. Yeah, thank you, Lane Gorman, Emily. Um, everyone involved, Lauren and Katie as well for organizing all this, really appreciate it.